Ah, thank you. Oh, goodness. Got a little feedback. Ah, just taking a breath so I could just shift hats and flip my book over. <laughs> so grand rising, everyone. And for those of you who are new to us, um, grand rising is a Caribbean greeting, which means good morning. And it's actually our, our theme this whole year at Centers for Spiritual Living. And our May theme is good to great to grand. And today's topic is called the inner landscape. So today we're actually at the starting line of our month-long journey, traveling from good to great to grand. So we begin first by exploring our inner landscape. Through observing what's going on inside of us and being curious about it, we get to embark upon a, self, a path of self-discovery. And that allows us to know more about, about ourselves, about who we are, and thus know more about the good we, we seek. So the exciting thing is by the end of the month, we'll each see how exploring our inner landscape um, actually transforms our, our, our outer landscape. We get to see ourselves by means of the world around us because how we see the outer world is a reflection of our inner landscape. Maybe I'll move away from this monitor a little bit. So, as many of you may know, um, our daughters are monozygotic twins. And I don't like to use the term identical because they are far from identical. Um, yes, they came from the same egg that split, and um, they shared the same placenta in, in the womb for 32 weeks. Um, they grew up in the same household. They uh, had the same brother and parents and step-parents and relatives. And for the first 21 years of their life, they actually shared a bedroom. And in childhood, they had many of the same friends, and they went to the same school from kindergarten to eighth grade. And now these twins are 27 years old, and they are very close. Um, in fact, I don't think a day goes by without them communicating with each other. Yet, they live totally different lives and have very different perspectives on life. And why do you think that is? It's certainly not biology, right? Because I don't think you can have a closer biological relationship than being a monozygotic twin. And it's because each has their own unique inner landscape. They see things differently. They feel things differently. They express themselves differently. And while their voices are very similar, which is part of that biology, <clears throat> they actually talk differently. In fact, um, when we used to all live together in the house and someone would call me from the home, from the home line, um, they'd say, hey, mom. And I'm like, hi, my love. <laughs> <laughs> and until they kept speaking, I didn't know who, who it was. And what I know is that if they were to explore their own inner landscapes, I know they would find out that it is not a, pro a product of their biology but is influence, influenced by their perception of everything that happened in and around their lives up into this point. So having twins is, is you know, it's different. Um, so starting in kindergarten, I purposefully put them in separate classrooms um, so they could more easily develop as individuals rather than as just a twin unit. And they definitely did that. Um, and while they're both talented and bright, they excelled in different areas of study and different areas of extracurricular activities. One was more in the sports, one was more into the arts. Um, so eventually, the twins went to different high schools. And all the while, each one is picking up on their own collective experiences and each one attaching meaning and feeling to each of these experiences, thus shaping their own inner landscapes. So when we look at our own inner landscape will reveal the same thing. Through one, observation, two, curiosity, and three, discovery, we'll become more familiar with our inner landscape 
And at that point, we get to learn more about ourselves, our patterns, our thoughts as they exist like right now. And then with that, we can purposefully move upward in consciousness, upward in our awareness of who we really are. So let's start with observation. So when observing our inner landscape, we're taking a little peek in, within, giving a glimpse of our, getting a glimpse of our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and even some hidden beliefs that are not at the forefront of our minds. Observation also helps us discover aspects of ourself that may be suppressed. Some of our passions, some of our strengths, and some of our values. And these aspects are just really essential to our self-actualization. So as we better observe ourselves, our desire to explore more and ask questions is fueled. And these questions that arise reveal to us where we are now, our current temperature. And then when we know our current temperature, then we start knowing ourselves at a deeper level, making conscious shifts in our lives rather than just living by default. Observing ourselves empowers us to detach from those limiting beliefs that tend to hold us back. Rumi said, and you, will you begin that long journey into yourself? Say yes. yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. So I'm just going to invite you to go within just for a few moments. Um, I'm going to say a series of words. After each word, I'm going to pause, give you a few seconds to let it sink in and observe what arises within you. So just get comfortable in your chair and allow your eyelids to soften and close. Take in a deep breath and release it and get ready to simply listen and observe. Darkness. Wilderness. Children. Mother. Father. Religion. Church. Deep blue sea. Mountain top. Flying. Floating. When you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back. Did you notice if any of these words brought up something within you? Maybe a positive or a negative reaction or maybe nothing. 
For some of you, perhaps darkness was actually peaceful. Like when the day is over and your body gets to rest. And for others, it may be related to sadness or despair. Maybe for some of you, wilderness was a bit frightening, like feeling lost or unprotected, and while others may have felt oneness with nature. Children may be a source of joy for some and possibly an annoyance for others. (laughs) Who knows? Mother or father may be associated with either positive or negative feelings, depending on your childhood experiences. The words religion or church may bring back certain feelings of of guilt, or maybe they have a feeling of abiding, abiding faith. Deep blue sea may instill calmness or perhaps rough waters. Mountaintop may be exhilarating or horrifying. Flying may make you feel free or possibly anxious. And floating, I wanted to end with something that I thought would make you feel safe and at peace. But that may not have been the case for everyone. It really is the everyday things that show us ourselves. What we are seeing out there in the world from our own perspective is truly a reflection of our inner landscape. Now let's talk about curiosity. So... When we're exploring our inner landscape, the curiosity is actually a catalyst for growth and expansion. And the curiosity is the quest for a greater understanding of ourselves and actually gently nudges us to stretch our comfort zones. You say, "Uh uh-oh, we don't like to stretch, but remember, stretching is a good thing. Like in sports or dance, it, it expands our flexibility, and makes us more prepared, more ready for whatever life presents to us. And I think it might have been maybe a year or two ago when uh, Dr. Alice spoke about the benefits of being curious rather than judgmental. Being curious opens us up to a better understanding of, of a person, a situation, or ourselves. So instead of asking, what the heck is wrong with that guy? You can be curious and just say, hmm, I wonder what's going on within him that made him choose to do or say that. And we can use that same process with ourselves. Instead of beating ourselves up over our feelings, our emotions, we can just ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder why that's making me feel this way. And then without judgment, without blame, just see what comes up. By simply getting curious, we can reveal our inner thoughts and again, possibly some hidden beliefs. And by making this a regular spiritual practice, it becomes a habit. And it helps us gain more discernment between what the truth of us is and what's just the garbage of our minds that's fueled by emotions and feelings. And then when we are able to differentiate the truth from the garbage, we can just toss that garbage in the imaginary trash can and let that imaginary garbage truck take it away forever. And when the garbage is gone, we become less weighed down and more open and receptive to spirit's messages to and through us, our intuition. And these messages are the key that unlocks the doors of wisdom, of insights, and spiritual truth. And then as we continue to evolve, make this a regular practice of ours, we transform our inner being and expand our awareness of who we really are. And when we are aware of who we really are, we are living our most authentic selves, our most authentic lives, our most enlightened selves. And this is something that the the Buddhists call bodhicitta. So now let's talk about discovery. Ernest Holmes, our founder, wrote this. In the divine providence of good, salvation is unnecessary, but self-discovery is essential. We do not save that which was lost. We merely discover that which needs to be found. 
In other words, it's not about becoming something new. It's simply revealing a greater awareness of who we really are, that enlightened self, that enlightened consciousness, that bodhicitta. We all have it. Each one of us here has it. It's just awaiting our discovery of it, just like electricity. And speaking of electricity, you know, most people think that Benjamin Franklin was discovered electricity back in 1751 when he attached the wire to the kite in the thunderstorm. But actually, no one person can be credited with discovering electricity. Many individuals have contrib contributed to the study of electricity over the centuries. And way back in 630 BCE, Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus discovered that rubbing amber from, uh, from tree sap with animal fur uh, attracted items like, like feathers. Static electricity in 630 BCE. And then around 1600, which is 150 years before Benjamin Franklin, England's English scientist William Gilbert coined the term electricus. And then in 1646, 46 years later, polymath Sir Thomas Brown altered the word and changed it to electricity. And there were several others that were working on the study of electricity. But the point is, it already existed. It just awaited discovery. Your electricity is your bodhicitta. Your awakening to who you really are. The more we delve into our inner landscapes, the more we uncover that electricity. By discovering and then releasing our limiting beliefs, throwing that garbage away, we are creating space for our bodhicitta to be revealed. This is the high electricity of ourselves. In the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says, life waits upon our discovery of natural laws, our discovery of ourselves, and our discovery of our relationship to the great whole. That's what it's all about. In fact, every Sunday, that's what it's all about. When we discover our relationship to the great whole, we don't need anything else. When we discover our relationship to the great whole, our inner landscape is our heavenly landscape, a place where we are being true to ourselves, true to the world around us. And we are being that bodhicitta. So again, to begin, to begin upon this path, this month-long month path of moving from good to great to grand, all we have to do is take that first step. A journey of a thousand miles begins with this single step. So this week, I invite you to cross the starting line on your journey. I invite you to begin right where you are, by taking time to observe your inner landscape and just notice it as, as it is, feelings, thoughts, emotions. Then get curious, continually ask yourself questions like, I wonder why this is making me feel that way. And without judgment, wait for the answers and be open and receptive to the insights and wisdom. And then set out to discover your bodhicitta that which already exists within you. You're never separate from it, because you are it. So delving into our inner landscapes this week through observation, curiosity, and discovery, we're going to be prepared for next week. Dr. Alice will then take us on our next step on the journey uh, through the value-led life. So in lieu of a closing prayer, I wanted to share with you this poem. It's by the third patriarch of Zen. His name is Sang San. It's called Trusting in Mind. And it's, it's a bit lengthy, so I want to invite you to close your eyes and open your mind. The 
The great way is not difficult. Don't pick and choose. If you cut off all likes or dislikes, everything is clear like space. Make the slightest distinction, and heaven and earth are set apart. If you wish to see the truth, don't think for or against. Likes and dislikes are the mind's disease. Without understanding the deep meaning, you cannot still your thoughts. It is clear like space, space, nothing missing, nothing extra. If you want something, you cannot see things as they are. Outside, don't get tangled in things. Inside, don't get lost in emptiness. Be still and become one, and all opposites disappear. If you stop moving to become still, this stillness always moves. If you hold on to opposites, how can you know one? If you don't understand one, this and that cannot function. Denied, the world asserts itself. Pursued, emptiness is lost. The more you think and talk, the more you lost the way. Cut off all thinking and pass freely anywhere. Return to the root and understand. Chase appearances and lose the source. One moment of enlightenment illuminates the emptiness before you. Emptiness changing into things is only our deluded view. Do not seek the truth. Only put down your opinions. Do not live in the world of opposites. Be careful. Never go that way. If you make right and wrong, your mind is lost in confusion. Two comes from one, but do not cling ever to this one. When your mind is undisturbed, the 10,000 things are without fault. No fault, no 10,000 things. No disturbance, no mind. No world, no one can see it. No one can see it, no world. This becomes this because of that. That becomes that because of this. If you wish to understand both, see them as originally one emptiness. In emptiness, the two are the same and each holds the 10,000 things. If you no longer see them as different, how can you prefer one to another? The way is calm and wide, not easy, not difficult. But small minds get lost. Hurrying, they fall behind. Clinging, they go too far. Sure to take a wrong turn, just let it be. In the end, nothing goes, nothing stays. Follow nature and become one with the way, free and easy and undisturbed. Tied by your thoughts, you lose the truth, become heavy, dull, and unwell. Not well, the mind is troubled. Then why hold or reject anything? If you want to get the one vehicle, do not despise the world of the senses. When you do not despise the six senses, that is already enlightenment. The wise do not act. The ignorant bind themselves. In true dharma, there is not this or that. So why blindly chase your desires? Using mind to stir up the mind is the original mistake. Peaceful and troubled are only thinking. Enlightenment has no likes or dislikes. All opposites arise from faulty views. Illusions flower in the air. Why try to grasp them? Win, lose, right, wrong. Put it all down. If the eye never sleeps, dreams disappear by themselves. If the mind makes no distinctions, the 10,000 things are one essence. Understand this one essence and be free from entanglements. See the 10,000 things as equal and you return to your original nature. Enlightened beings everywhere all enter this source. This source is beyond time and space. One moment is 10,000 years. 
Even if you cannot see it, the whole universe is before your eyes. Infinitely small is infinitely large. No boundaries, no difference. Infinitely large is infinitely small. Measurements do not matter here. What is, is the same as what is not. What is not is the same as what is. Where it is not like this, don't bother staying. One is all, all is one. When you see things like this, you do not worry about being incomplete. Trust and mind are not two. No two is trusting the mind. Words and speech don't cut it. Can't now. Never could. Won't ever. And so it is. <laughs>